Uh, just so you know, automated closed captioning is available for this workshop. The link is, uh, directions are in the chat. Uh, welcome to the Texas Children and Nature Network uh, virtual webinar, uh, Research Towards Resilience. My name is Sarah Coles. I am the Executive Director of Texas Children and Nature Network, and we are excited to have you with us today. We are recording our session today. Thank you for joining us. To save bandwidth and for uh, the video purposes, we do ask everyone to turn off their camera and mute themselves during the presentation. I will be monitoring the chat so you can share any questions you have there and I will share them with our presenters. Don Wibble is running tech for us today. Thank you, Don. As I said, we are recording today's session. Alice will share it up in a following email in the coming days. If you are uncomfortable with your name showing, you can change your name to anonymous and then private message Dawn with your name for our attendance. Also, if your Zoom name doesn't match the name you registered with, please change your name or let Dawn know. If you are in need of a certificate for this webinar, we do need to have your name. If we do not have your name, we will not be able to provide you with a certificate. I'm gonna go ahead and do our land acknowledgement. Texas Children and Nature Network is headquartered in Austin. And as such, I'm on the ancestral and unceded land of the Tonkawa, Comanche, and Sana people. Our ongoing colonial presence on indigenous lands compels us to take action now to counteract the effects of colonization. The work we do through the Texas Children and Nature Network is one small step towards that effort. To learn more about land acknowledgements and these people groups, I'm gonna put some links in the chat. I would like to go ahead and welcome our speakers today, Jonathan Lowell and Tasha Banks from the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome everyone and take it away. Great, thank you, Sarah. And thank you for the patience in getting this um, kind of hybrid meeting set up. Um, just for the folks um, on Zoom, we have about 20 or so, 25 people here in the room. Um, so a good turnout and um, thanks for being here. Um, so my name is Jonathan Lowell. I'm the Engagements and Programs Coordinator uh, for Planet Texas 2050. Um, uh, ah, okay. Um, so uh, just go uh, do a pre uh, quick overview. So I'll do a brief background on how Planet Texas 2050 came together as a research grand challenge um, and go over PT 2050's mission, vision, and guiding values. Um, an overview of activities um, in the research portfolio, um, a couple of highlights on youth engagement and some exciting things we're working on, and then we'll transition to uh, Tasha Banks, who will be um, going in depth with one of our particular research projects. Um, let's see. I'm just making sure I'm heard. Yes. Um, so Planet Texas 2050 is a research grand challenge, which is a specific term referring to a trend across the big universities in the US to leverage the resources of these universities towards bigger picture societal problems. Sustainability, resilience, and generally environmentally themed challenges are common, and they're predicated on two main principles, um, interdisciplinary research, or the idea that these complex issues require the input and expertise across various academic disciplines, as well as community expertise, and that the fundamental research undertaken should be done with social impact in mind. Uh, how can this research shift narratives and public conversations, uh, create tools and resources for people to do their jobs more effectively, um, help with uh, policy making or implementation, um, or how can it contribute to communities, uh, particularly marginalized communities, in their efforts towards capacity building and, and advocacy? Um, so these are questions that uh, we always try to keep at the top of our mind when uh, pursuing our, our project. Um, Planet Texas was the first of these grand challenges um, to come online in 2018. Um, with these twin challenges in mind, the overlapping challenges of climate change and increasing population in our urban centers, and the strain that that will continue to put on our resources and infrastructure, our ability to properly prepare and respond to weather-related disasters, and exacerbated effects that this will have on our already marginalized communities uh, with an unequal share of environmental burdens placed on those communities uh, along lines of race, class, ethnicity, and uh, geography. 
So we have um, uh, the original team. Uh, this is a picture of them in 2018. As you can see, um, they were a broad, a broad disciplinary scope from engineering, um, the school of geosciences, English, uh, regional planning, population health, uh, classics, and, um, and the Texas Advanced Computing Center. So this was sort of built into the ethos was to have these, these disciplinary perspectives really shaping uh, the direction of the initiative. And when they got together, um, one of the initial conversations, I was not there at the time, um, but my understanding is like that one line of conversation was to think about um, what is called the dry line or the 100th meridian, you can see that line going across Texas, it actually extends up um, past Texas, obviously. Um, but the idea of that line was that west of it um, was really like that the water and the water resources would not support agriculture without significant infrastructure. And then the further east you go, um, the more the more capacity there is to do so. And that it's been shown that that line seems to be just uh, drifting eastward. And so we're getting a little bit drier as a state and we're then that line is moving right into our uh, urban corridor extending up from Rio Grande Valley um, through San Antonio, Austin and Dallas Fort Worth. And so these kind of, these twin things kind of colliding became sort of like a, an interesting visual hook to think about for our for our work. Um, and you know, in those early days, there was like a lot of meetings about um, creating these these diagrams of all these arrows and points of connection um, with this big picture in mind. Um, and it can get a little like com convoluted and con and confusing, but the idea was that we needed to get all these different perspectives from applied sciences, health sciences, the humanities and the arts, fundamental sciences. Um, but it can all kind of be summed up um, with trying to make the state of Texas uh, more resilient. Now, resilience is a complicated term. Um, we recognize that a lot of people. Um, actively oppose it in, in a way um, because it can be used to uh, naturalize oppression. Um, and it can be, and the idea that uh, resilience is about bouncing back uh, to a previous state can also serve to um, kind of uphold the status quo. Um, but we, it's a term that we do use, even though like we, rec we recognize all the problems with it, but we find that um, it, it is a term that does bring people together um, not necessarily in harmony, but in a way of bringing people together to talk about these issues. Um, and that it does, it seems to do so in a way that that doesn't work with other terms where it's a, it's a term to argue with, it's a term to bring te people together. Um, and it also, the idea of it does also speak back to this idea of needing multiple perspectives, multiple senses of expertise. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and some of our teams uh, are actively engaged in sort of how do we redefine it? How do we, um, you know, acknowledge like the, the problems with it? Um, but again, finding that we, it's something that we use to, to, to bring a lot of different topics together under one, under one umbrella. Um, so as we've moved forward as an initiative, uh, we've developed uh, a set of values, um, you know, and I think resilience, uh, what that connects to is this idea of, of their shared goals and their, and their shared fate. Um, a, a few other val values that we've articulated, mostly kind of internally for ourselves, but kind of like um, reflecting them back outward and thinking about what they actually mean in terms of the work that we do and the relationships that, um, that we build and maintain. Um, is equity. So think, which means like really thinking through uh, resources um, um, and obviously financial, but also uh, time, labor, um, products, outputs, and their distribution and impacts and understanding of the, of, of power dynamics in, in that. Um, and so thinking like through, and that thinking about the resources, not just um, both as the community groups that we work with, the stakeholder groups we work with, um, but also our, our own and thinking, um, you know, 
that it's all resources and we need to think about how to best uh, distribute them equally uh, in order for um, to leverage um, the best impact um, discovery. So everyone is a co-producer of knowledge, curiosity, and collaborative spirit. Um, resilient, uh, I said that one already, mission-driven, so shared goals and reciprocity, um, interdisciplinarity, so multiple valid epistemologies or, or ways of knowing, um, and deliberate, so clear governance, decision-making, and communication, uh, being transparent and accountable. Um, and so here are some of our key, our key partners that we've developed over the years. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, it is uh, Amplify Austin Day. Um, so I would say support our, our particular our Austin-based partners, Austin Youth Riverwatch, uh, GAVA, um, Texas Children and Nature Network, uh, EcoRise, um, Community Powered Workshop, uh, Forklift Dance Works. Um, these are uh, Waterloo Greenway. Um, these are all Austin-based uh, organizations, but we have an extend, uh, extension to um, Rio Grande Valley with the Museum of South Texas History, um, Indigenous Cultures Institute, um, and then uh, Nature Conservancy and, uh, and Microsoft. And the city of Austin is a, a big partner that has a lot of different tentacles as well. Uh, and here's our current leadership. Um, we've grown a little bit. You might you might not have noticed, but these are all totally different people from five years ago. So it's a it's a total ship of Theseus situation where the the boat pieces have been replaced over time as it journeys across the sea. And is it, is it the same boat anymore if all the pieces are different? And I think in our case, it, it definitely is. Um, but we have a similar um, scope. We have people in in fine arts, we have people um, in in the College of Liberal Arts, uh, integrated biology, uh, public affairs, uh, School of Architecture, um, and geosciences and, and engineering. And uh, I, the story of like our whole research por portfolio over the last few years has been, you know, roughly almost three dozen projects that you could be that you could identify and we've and we've probably connected with close to 200 different uh faculty members um and that that's obviously like way too much to get into uh, um so at the moment we have developed uh what we call flagship teams that we that we started developing kind of right around when the pandemic started in 2020 uh, with the idea that these would be the projects that would carry Planet Texas forward till the end of the, the project's life cycle, which is in 2027. So these would be multi-year projects that give uh, the project members team to time to grow, develop, um, develop partnerships, um, develop partnerships internally with each other, with a network of researchers, but also with, with community partners, knowing that we have a multi-year time cycle. We're not trying to get something done in a, in a month or two and then, and then walk away. Like we're, we're trying to um, be have have that space to be more uh, more deliberate. Um, we have um, I'll just go over them really quickly. Uh, so we have frontline community partnerships with for climate justice, um, which Tasha here will go into depth. But it is partnering with diverse populations to research and discover locally led solutions to the climate crisis while identifying new green career pathways out of poverty. Uh, resilience in species and ecosystems, quantifying landscapes and ecosystem change by monitoring plant and animal communities by developing new remote sensor technologies and engaging with the public with issues of biodiversity, equitable and regenerative cities in a post-carbon future, um, is reimagining more equitable and resource efficient metropolitan areas while safeguarding the food, fiber and fuel and water that people and the planet depend on. Uh, networks for hazard preparedness and response, uh, preparing for flood and heat waves by designing new maps and tools for first responders, neighborhood associations, city governments, and planners, uh, developing new models that enable scientists, policymakers, and city managers, and communities to harness vast amounts of data from a variety of sources to make effective and timely climate-related decisions. And stories of ancient resilience, uh, examining the past re-examining the past to inspire a new vision of human resilience and effective response to the climate crisis. Uh, I'm sure uh, 
all, all those teams would have way more to say, but this is just like a, a brief distillation of that. And I also wanted to point out, we have kind of two newer additions as our leadership team has, has grown. Um, we have, um, they don't have catchy titles at the moment, uh, but we have Urban Climate and Heat led by Dave Niogi, um, who came on uh, with, to us a couple of years ago from Purdue and he was a state climatologist there. So we have like a, like a more robust kind of climate um, connection because actually um, a lot of our work that climate change was much more like the sort of context in which we worked in it was less we were not, not um, doing much examining around climate change itself um, but with with Dave on board we have more of that on uh, and part of our portfolio and uh, creative collaborations led by uh, uh, Katie Dawson in this in the School of Fine Arts uh, developing arts based community collaborations and academia K through 12 spaces and beyond. No, I keep pressing that wrong button. Um, and just I wanted to go quickly through a couple of our, of our projects. Um, so we have um, kind of mapping vulnerability at different scales. Um, so on the right is a, uh, a, a, um, a map, a, a multi-layered map of uh, topology topography, rivers, storm systems, and roads with the idea of like, we need to map all of these together to have more robust uh, flood maps in times, uh, particularly in times of emergency. Like the, the sort of FEMA flood map is not really sufficient to do that kind of work because it doesn't account for um, the urban hydrology system, the sewer system, other parts of the built environment, um, et cetera. Uh, and so this uh, tool they're developing is like, combining that data together in order to generate um, rapid maps um, for first responders when they arrive at the scene of a crisis. Um, and that's just one small piece of their, of their project. And then on the left, we have um, a, a environmental suitability map for um, Burkholderia pseudomaliae, I think that, or maliae, I think that's how you say it. And um, that is a pathogen that grows uh, in the soil and causes a, a disease called meliodosis, um, which can be uh, fatal. Um, and we don't really see it in, in Texas or anywhere else in the US, but as climate as the climate is changing, we're seeing much more of those tropical diseases make their way up into Texas. Um, and uh, uh, this team led by, by Dr. Katie Brown is trying to um, map on, like make a predictive map of how this disease or the pathogen that carries it can grow in Texas. And so trying to, so it's a kind of a much kind of broader time scale and, and spatial scale. Um, and so that just sort of shows the sort of um, scope of how, like both in terms of time and place, time and, and space, how uh, the different mapping tools that we uh, are pursuing can lead to um, both responding and preparing for various kinds of, of environmental challenges. Um, and then we have uh, a, a project that is building sensor networks. And I'm pointing this from now on, I'm, I'm also pointing out these projects for our audience in Texas Children and Nature, because I know they have a deep interest in youth engagement and other sorts of environmental education. Um, so uh, so when, I, when I'm bringing up the building sensor networks by Dr. Tim Kitt, so he and, and various you know, dozens of other collaborators um, they are developing a sensor system um, that can be passively placed in environments and this record data continuously. Um, and that make, can make for a much more robust and accurate data set um, rather than doing field sites. Um, and so it can just live in the field, be weather protected, stream the data um, to, and then use machine learning tools to, um, to interpret um, the animal sounds, um, you know, sometimes it can be soil moisture, temperature readings, all these sorts of things to develop like a much more un robust understanding of uh, the different microclimates in Texas and other sorts of regional effects. And I think um, we would be interested in, in, in how we could deploy these sensors like within, um, in collaboration with, with schools and educators, either like on site at schools or as part of, of school projects. Um, so just wanting to, um, to put that out there. Um, and then we have a, a few other projects that we've 
that we've engaged with youth over time. I'm going to run through these really quickly. Um, so Nick Bennett from uh, the Moody School has, uh, they developed a project, Transmissions from 2050, in collaboration with Austin Youth Riverwatch, uh, where we uh, they gathered youth together um, around the question of what would the world look like in 2050, and how can we um, um, over like in, in a group together really question the narratives around um, environmental challenges um, and develop our own and kind of develop them into a uh, a, col a collaborative performance that they performed. I think in summer 2021, I believe that was. Uh, drama for schools. Um, let me get, have my description here. Um, which is a program that outdates Planet Texas by a great deal, like two decades, I think, right? Um, and so, but we are blessed to have um, Katie Dawson and Laura Dossett um, from Theater and Dance and get involved in our initiative. Um, so DFS is a collaborative uh, research-based professional learning model facilitated by faculty from the, the uh, Department of Theater and Dance uh, here at UT Austin. Um, DFS has developed a, a specific pedagogical practice that uses active and dramatic approaches to engage students in aesthetic, effective, and body-based practices in order to deepen student engagement and academic learning across the curriculum. DFS also facilitates cross-discipline connections between artists, researchers, and communities in order to create uh, more possibilities for youth to be catalysts for change. Um, so they've, they've been working with some of our other uh, Planet Texas projects, especially um, Stories of Ancient Resilience and their, uh, their studies of water in, in, in Mayan antiquity and, and connecting it to um, students today, like how do we think about water um, what does water mean to you? How do, you know, water is life and how does that, you know, and making this curriculum that connected to, um, you know, making these, what would seem far-fetched, but are actually like, can be really, um, really uh, current and, and relevant connections for students and thinking about, uh, about water. Uh, and I'll go in more depth about, because there's an opportunity for DFS later, I, will, I want to explore. Um, Texas Water Stories um, was led by Fakile uh, Zumalo, who worked with summer camps in uh, with the Indigenous Cultures Institute in San Marcos to explore um, sort of the more sacred nature of water. And I'm, I'm going to have to go really fast to make sure I get, give enough time for Tasha. Um, I believe the the Texas Children and Nature audience knows about this, but the Gen Thrive uh, collaboration. Um, was in part supported by um, Texas Advanced Computing Center, provided some of the computing support to create this database that's a directory of K through 12 environmental resources um, and organizations and gives um, educators and other, other interested uh, stakeholders in environmental ed um, to understand the landscape of environmental education in Texas and I think in many other states at this point. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to skip the arts engagement, but we have like a really robust, um, since we brought on our, our director, Heidi Schmalbach, who comes from the arts nonprofit background, has done amazing work in bringing artists um, on board into our, our project. Um, and unfortunately, I won't go too much into it, but we, part of that was sponsoring a, a podcast called Planet Texas, led by uh, our student, um, Maya Berry, uh, just tremendous work on different like kind of short stories of the different challenges that we've had from Hurricane Harvey to the Bastrop fire um, to the winter storm. So I recommend uh, checking out that podcast. Um, and here are our current artist fellows um, who are, we have a kind of, oh, what I would say, like not a, a pipeline of projects for our artists. We're kind of seeding a garden uh, by by giving them uh, stipend to then like just to kind of explore possible connections and projects with our work over the next months and then see kind of what might grow from there without real any um, like real directive of what it can or, or, or should look like. Um, and yeah, so our next steps, so we have um, 
we have a, a Department of Energy grant um, that is funding a lot of this disciplinary work um, down in Southeast Texas. Uh, and then we have uh, a summer camp that is going to be put on by Drama for Schools um, that is bringing educators together uh, to co learn and co-teach about justice-oriented arts-based environmental education. It'll be a kind of um, research project. Um, I, uh, yeah, I will say if you're if anyone is interested in it, they can like get in touch with me, and I will direct you to the people who who know most about it. But it will be sent. Uh, it's set to take place in early June, either one of the first two weeks of June. It'll be like a four day uh, workshop um, around like a youth participatory action uh, project that will be co-developed between um, the facilitators of, of Drama for Schools and the teachers who are interested in, in participating. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Tasha. Thanks, Jonathan. We'll, we'll, we'll save her questions till the end. Yes. Thanks, Jonathan. So I'm Tasha Banks. I am the Assistant Director for the Division of Community Engagement and Health Equity in Dell Medical School. And I'm the Project Director for the Frontline Community Partnerships for Climate Justice. And I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about our project. Um, and just briefly meet our team, our co-leads, Miriam Solis and Carmen Valdez, and our wonderful GRAs, Catherine Perez and Anna Chatham. And we really work as a team to put this project in a place. And another important piece of this project are our anchor community partners. We could not do this work without them. And our anchor partners are environmental education organizations, also grassroots organizations based in either urban or rural areas. So we have worked with EcoRise, um, East Austin College Prep, and are currently working with Texas Children in Nature. So a bit about our work, we are working with frontline communities to better understand their environmental challenges and daily stressors and to identify opportunities and strategies for climate action and environmental justice. And um, just thinking about environmental justice in Texas, um, you know, low income communities bear the brunt of a lot of these worsening conditions through climate injustice and disasters, they're exposed to more toxins. And even just in, you know, um, Austin, I think we're ninth among 198 cities that have experienced increases in heat danger days, which means heat over 105 degrees. And um, that this, this heat is higher in neighborhoods that have been redlined before or are already disadvantaged um, based on you know, race, policies, income, fewer mature trees in these areas, limited access to air conditioning, poor air quality, and as we have seen here in Austin as well, winter storms. And these environmental impacts have, uh, have impact mental health and the health and well-being of people and specifically young people. Um, can lead to depression, PTSD, increased anxiety. And this is all compounded by the chronic stressors that already exist in a lot of these communities, including racism, violence, um, poor housing, uh, over-policing, reduced access to medical care. And so we're thinking about climate action strategies and mitigation and adaptation strategies are essential, but they tend to be approached technically from a quantitative standpoint, a traditional research standpoint, and we really wanted to think about it from a community standpoint. And we know that youth of color know and make place. They are in those communities. They know what they are experiencing in those communities. And we wanted to hear their voices about what those experiences are and also their thoughts and ideas of how to address some of these issues. So our aims are to learn about the environmental burdens and hazards of youth in these frontline urban and rural communities, um, but also experience, you know, identify their ideas for environmental improvement and to also help support that improvement through coalition building. And then beyond that, hopefully to have possibly an impact in policy changes and policy development. 
So the methods that we are using are community engaged research and the, the crux of that is using photo, photo voice and youth leadership and development to, to do this research and also coalition building. We really are aiming to build coalitions of grassroots organizations, but also um, governmental organizations, school organizations in these areas to think about uh, what they also see and how they can help in, address some of these issues that come up. And community sharing. We an important part of that is not just doing the work and taking the photos and doing photo voice, but also being able to share what we've learned and share those voices at large with the community. I'm going to do that just right now. <laughs> yes. So photo voice is, um, is a research method. And what it is, is that per participants take photos to address research questions um, that are related to their lived experience. And those research questions don't necessarily come just from us as the researchers, but are hopefully co-developed with the coalition. And also at times in, you know, initially meeting with the young people, they may have things that in our discussions come up that may lead to the research questions that we ask as well. So after taking the photos, they, you know, follow, following some prompts and sort of expand on the meaning of the photos, what it means to them, what it means to their community, and what ultimately that the photos and narratives that they develop around these pictures are shared with the public to raise awareness and possibly impact policy. So why do photo voice? It engages people, mobilizing them, raising awareness, getting them really engaged in their community and engaging with local knowledge. It focuses on the everyday. So we really want to know about their everyday experiences, things that they see in their um, everyday activities, just going about the, their daily lives and identifying issues in a way that better reflects their experiences and making visible things that might be hard to quantify. And then it also strengthens community. So it helps to establish community driven priorities and encourages community building activities and also brings in that community voice. Um, as I'm sure we all know and experience sometimes when policies get made, a community voice may not be brought in until after the policy ideas have been put together instead of at the beginning and really being a collaborative experience of developing those policies together. So just a bit about our photo voice workshop process. So we start with framing the issues, discussing the concepts such as environmental justice, racial equity and local issues. For example, which I will go into more in depth in a, in a minute, our first photo voice workshops were here in Austin. And we thought it was really important to um, sort of set the context in terms of the history of Austin, the 1928 plan, redlining, how communities, came to be in a certain way here in Austin so that they have um, context in regards to what they see in their neighborhoods that may be a bit deeper than just the surface level things that they, they may see. And the second part is collecting. So walking, sensing, talking to others, gathering data, talking to each other in these workshops, going out in their communities, um, thinking about more deeply about those things that they may see and experience every day. And, um, and also taking photos and then analysis of that. So we help them select their pictures, think about, um, start thinking about what story or narrative they have about those photos, sharing out, providing feedback, um, helping them maybe think a little bit deeper about what their stories are of, of what it might mean for not just them, but also their community. And then the last piece is reporting and celebrating. And we want to provide a space again, not where we're just collecting data and them taking photos just to just for photo's sake, but be able to share their stories out and formally present them to their communities, but also people who may be in those position to, um, to do actionable things to, to combat some of these issues that are raised. 
So part of the photo voice um, method is the showed method. So the idea is that they take their, their picture or something in their neighborhood that they see, and then we go through a series of asking these questions. So what do you see here where they're identifying what it actually is that is, is in the picture? What's happening in the picture? How does it affect our lives? And then thinking about why does this condition exist and what can we do about it? And with those last two questions, I think it's it's also very important when we at the beginning set the context because sometimes it can feel um, like a very individualistic of, of a personal reason of why does this exist of because uh, individual choice or um, uh, what can we do about it if them feeling like I don't have power to do any of these things. And I think setting that context provides a, a deeper explanation of maybe it's not just individual choice that created the situation. Maybe there's something deeper, systemic, institutional, policy driven that also helped to create create these situations. So this is just an example of one of our uh, photo voice participants, a picture that one of our youth took, um, and just some preliminary thoughts of answering those questions. So this is a picture of a street that both cars and people use at the same time. There's no signals. Um, I don't even think there are any um, road bombs. Cars come from right and left all the time, they said. And, and why they took this picture is this is the, on their way to school. And they pass by the street every day. And there are cars that are coming and going fast as they're trying to cross this part on their way to school. Um, and the effect is, is that it's dangerous for cars and drivers and people who walk in the street. And just thinking about... Um, it's probably, you know, how dangerous it is for this young person just on their walk to school of having to navigate the space. Um, why does this condition exist? Because it's a, a small place, but a lot of people live here. Also, there are a lot of cars because of the street that connects with stores. But then what can we do about it? We need to mobilize city governors about problems because it, if we don't complain, they'll think that everything is fine here. And I think there's a lot of spaces in cities and are in these neighborhoods that we don't know about that we're not experiencing on our everyday but they do and that it's really important for us to listen about those lived experience because I you know I bet this is not on on the minds of people who have power to maybe do something about this because they they don't know about it so some of the preliminary findings and themes that came out of our this first photo voice workshop that we did here in Austin um, was thinking about um, a lot that came up was homelessness and that uh, for a lot of them walking to and from school or driving home they are witnessing people experiencing homelessness and um and there were some really interesting conversations around that of why that might be, but also of how that makes them feel about their neighborhoods and their communities. And they were hyper aware, uh, some of them, of, of we are in a poor community and that is why that is here. And for me, that is a bit heartbreaking of, of that internalized and individualistic way of thinking of like, because we are this, then that instead of a system has helped create these situations and it is not um, the fault of the people necessarily in those communities. Um, gentrification and displacement was also another issue. We think about um, a lot of youth of color and youth of low on income communities here, their families have to move a lot because of, we, we know affordability is an issue here in Austin, um, getting displaced, thinking about um, how far they may have to go to school. Um, East Austin College Prep was the main school that a lot of youth came from, and it is a public charter school, a Title I public school, but that means that they're coming from all over to come to this charter school um, all over the Austin area. Um, lack of infrastructure, investments. Um, we had one youth in particular who was talking about um, the bus stop that she uses on her way to school, and that there's no cover on that bus stop. Um, and 
not just on hot days, but when it's raining, they're getting her and her sister out there getting wet while they're waiting for the bus or, you know, coming home. And so different things like that, the little things that we, we may not think about that, that can actually make a really big difference for some of them in these communities. Um, and just having an openness to the wide spectrum of issues that, that youth brought out. So some of our ongoing challenges um, that we experienced with this project was youth recruitment and participation. As we know, the pandemic has impacted a lot of things and youth of color and low income neighborhoods already had challenges such as transportation, um, some of them work as well. And we held these workshops, two in person, um, two virtually, but on the weekends. And so that means some had issues maybe getting to the workshop. Um, maybe some were able to come to the first one, but not the other two. They may have had to work. We had a youth that actually worked cleaning hotels from 4 to 6 a.m. and then made it to the workshop. But I also think that's a testament of them wanting to tell their stories and have their voices heard that they still made it to come to this experience. Um, access to te technology. We learned that virtual is probably not the best um, for some of these youth because they just don't have that access to technology. And at school, luckily the school has that access such as Chromebooks that they can use on site, but thinking about at home on the weekend, um, not just the hardware, but also internet access and different things like that. Um, and then in Austin, it was a challenge to build uh, a coalition and we did try, but trying to get those partners together was definitely challenging. So we didn't end up having a, a traditional coalition here in Austin for that part of the project. And then also an exhibition of our, our Austin Photo Voice participants. We are still working on getting an exhibition for our Austin youth and hopefully we'll have something um, this summer, either or next fall, but once once the workshop ends, we do we would love to continue those relationships. But again, we are competing with lots of different um, factors that are going on in their lives for continued engagement. So we are now in our current phase of photo voice, with um, that is taking place in far in the, in the Rio Grande Valley, and uh, with our focus on children who live in neighborhoods where the Rio Grande pose a uh, flood and extreme heat risks and um, workshopping to include field service in neighborhoods and also focusing on community informed environmental amenities that are accessible. And we are working with our amazing anchor partner, Texas Children in Nature, and their grassroots or a uh, network of over 700 partner organizations and individuals that are really dedicated to connecting children and families with nature in Texas um, and just have a mission to ensure equitable access and connect connection to nature for all children in Texas. So um, Texas Children in Nature and UT are, have um, led the coalition building. We have a coalition of about uh, 10 members made up of governmental organizations, grassroots organizations, um, and those coalition meetings started in January. Um, and lesson learned from our workshop here in Austin, the importance of being in person. So that first coalition meeting happened um, in the Rio Grande Valley in person in January. Um, and um, like I said, it can include local advocates, school and city offices, grassroots organizations, and they are really helping to us to think about the plan and how to recruit for photo voice, which um, youth, communities of youth may be uh, appropriate or good for us to recruit from, and then how to use the data to shape these small scale projects. So some of the preliminary things that have come out of those first uh, two coalition meetings are thinking about access to parks, who has access to them, um, is there shade in the parks, thinking about heat related, uh, you know, heat, high heat days in the RGV, um, safety, resident engagement, and then also what is the desire of the community surrounding park areas. So there's uh, two park areas that we 
are looking at that they're looking to develop in this area and thinking about community needs and what what would be best suited for the community in these areas. And then also what have community asked for versus what the city is thinking about planning and making sure or seeing if there can be alignment between those two things. And also thinking about the assets that already exist in the community. Um, thinking about artists that are there and maybe thinking about art that could be at these parks or a place for art to take place. Um, educational allies that are already in this community. Maybe there are educational programs or some sort of programming that could take place in the park for youth, for parents, for families, um, and just really brainstorming about what that could look like. So next steps, um, like you said, we've had two coalition meetings. So I think the third coalition meeting will happen in the next month or so, but then we're doing our next round of photo voice workshops in April um, with the hope that upon completion of the photo voice that we are planning to stage a community UT exhibit with local artists there in the Rio Grande Valley and also here as well. Um, and then, with our Austin participants, again, an exhibit hopefully planned for the summer of 2023. So um, they are beginning to start the process of recruitment of youth for in the RGV. And um, I think we're all very excited to see what kind of youth sign up and just see their, hear their stories and ideas of their communities and their place, what they're seeing. Um, their thoughts of how to address those issues, and then hopefully how that might impact um, some of the park development, but other different city policies. And that is it. I wanted to make sure we have enough time for questions for in the room and also for those on Zoom. So our first question yeah. in the Zoom is, I. Um, I'd be interested to know the reaction of the youth using photo voice, and that's from Sherry. Can you say a bit more reaction in terms of um, engaging with taking photos or just the, the project itself? The question just says reaction. Well, I can say, I'll say that I think, or the Austin youth were really, um, really engaged with taking the photos. They were really excited, really engaged. Um, I I think it was something new and different for them that they'd never experienced before. So there was uh, a bit of a learning curve of sort of, uh, so what are we taking photos of? What are we looking for? So um, a lot of coaching in that regard in terms of, um, of sort of the kinds of things and, and not not prompting per se, but just giving examples. And we walk them through sort of um, a, an example beforehand of a picture that we had of that was taken here in Austin and with the showed method of getting them to sort of think about those things for themselves. But um, they seem to really enjoy the process and we're still working with them to finish, uh, finish up writing their narrative so that we can have an exhibition for them here. Hi, I'm so excited. <laughs> I teach photography all the time to you. So I have all these little questions. So what is that balance you have found between giving them the camera or telling them to pick up their cell phone mm -hmm. and getting them photographing mm -hmm. and developing the themes and giving them information on how to create a good photo like how much how much mm -hmm. technical photo information are you giving mm -hmm. versus just letting them discover and how, like I love this show method because it gets them thinking and how much do you do that in the front end and the back end mm -hmm. those kind of like yeah bring me into your weeds please okay. I'll bring you into our weeds um I say I will say I think we could have maybe done a bit more technical photo like technicality of how to take a photo on the front end. We sort of set it up of like 
you know, take some, take some photos and then we'll come back for the second workshop and think about or the third workshop and think about those photos. And if you want to retake and discuss their photos a bit with them and sort of give pointers on that in. Um, but I think going forward, the idea is to hopefully have possibly an artist in our project and far to come and sort of be that artistic eye about photographs and taking photographs um, and giving a bit more direction in that bit. Um, for Austin, we're sort of doing it, you know, as we're helping them with their narratives, we're also asking them if they would like to retake the photo of the same thing. If asking like, do you like the lighting in this? Is it too dark or are you good with this? And uh, most of them are like, it's fine, but <laughs> you know, cause they're teenagers, right? They're using cell phones. Mm -hmm. But for those who may not have had cell phones, we prepared if we were, uh, you know, we would have a, a camera available or something for those who didn't have cell phone access, but every, every one of them have used a cell phone so far. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have oh what question? Yeah. Um, so the next question from Zoom. Um, is for me and it as will the work of the different teams be brought together in some way um i knew i was going to get this question um Good question. and i would say so my understanding when the initiative first started was that the idea was to i've, I've heard the term like uh, from our former director jenny jenny nelson gray that they're going to build like a resilience rocket ship or like <laughs> some sort of like complicated machine that you could like put in put in something and then get out an answer of like what to do about flooding or what to do about um, how to manage soil or all these different things and then and also like and something that would feed in different sorts of qualitative responses as well um, and I think that we found that to be un unworkable um, kind of on the face of it I think well for one we would need like way more people uh, way, way more money. Uh, we we were we we're fairly well resourced, but that that would be like orders of magnitude more resources to to do something like that. Um, and so what I would say is um, we're not building like so if that metaphor of like building up something um, doesn't hold. Um, what we're doing is we're sort of networking and kind of building out. Um, and so like within the different. Um, so the previous projects that we've had, um, they've fed into those six current or eight projects that we have now. Like the tentacles of all of those projects are 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 in those previous work. Those teams are finding points of connection within each other. Um, you know, in combinations of two or three teams usually. Um, and I wouldn't say they're all going again like pointing in the same direction necessarily. They're more like like expanding outwork as a sort of collaborative web. Um, and I, I think that that feels like the like the most like feasible way for us to work together. Um, and in terms of like, and then another thing I'll say is that um, the the resources of, of this initiative will will expire in 2027, but we we're we're trying to have the mindset that the we're using those resources to seed things that will live on after that date. And so um, that this is sort of trying to build um, the relationships, the scaffolding um, to for for those sorts of collaborations to continue past that time. Um, and but it would be cool to to think of like some way, some kind of summation document or like a book or something like that. I would make that pitch to our to our researchers. Actually, yeah, like let's let's do an edited monograph or something like that um but i but yeah it's um that is how like we try to bring the work together yes i do um oh thank you that's my i might be too loud in this um i'm wondering where the photo voice idea as a research methodology came from and whether you had already used it before tasha or somebody on your team had and why that that's a good question. So I came onto the team a bit later. One of our co-leads is in the audience, Miriam, of where the photo voice idea came from, since I, I wasn't there for that, but not to put you on the spot, but. Um, 
Um, so I, oh, thank you. Um, thanks again for the question. I, I've used photo voice before. I used it actually in a recent project with the Austin Civil and Conservation Corps, which is a green workforce development program here in Austin. And um, photo voice, you know, we, we Planet Texas as a whole has a strong commitment to equity. Um, I have a social science background, and um, in my subfield of social science, we often draw on arts-based methods as a way of linking actual applied community engagement with generating the kind of information that we need to make to generate better environmental responses. And so um, it was really my social science orientation drawing on arts-based methods that is um, that prompted me and as well as the team to think about photo voice. Um, and the, the exciting thing for me about photo voice is that there's like a subset of critical photo voice. So it's conceptually linked to larger bodies of scholarship that think very critically about settler colonialism and racism. Um, and so there, there's great diversity within the method itself that I think lends itself for these very applied conversations. Thank you. Um, I have been trained in a lot of in the early days of uh, service learning methodology, and this feels like a really good like layup for that, like that sort of looking around and really evaluating what's going on in your community as a starting place to decide what you want to do to make a, make a difference and then create a plan from there. But have you have you linked up in that way to turn it from ideas to action or have you seen others doing that? We haven't gotten to that part yet, but I think that is definitely a hope of what we would like to do and to come out of our photo voice workshop with the idea of starting with that exhibition piece of bringing in and inviting people who are some of those people who can change and make action to come and see these photos and read these narratives and to get them start to think about what is happening in these communities and um, I hope that for us to continue those conversations with those people about what those impacts are and and how we can affect policy change in those spaces. Um, but that is that's the goal of of this the of doing the photo voice piece of how we can put this into some sort of actionable way, hopefully. Hi, Tasha, you touched on this a little bit in the response you just gave, but um, I'll admit I'm a little surprised that this project, which I think is fantastic for youth and community engagement, lives in the Dell Medical School. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about where this fits into the Dell Medical School ecosystem and why this mm -hmm. is in the Dell Medical School. Sure. Well, I'm in the population health department, and so we are... We are focused on the aspect of health, the 80% of health and well-being that takes place outside of the clinic. Only 20% of our health is clinic-based and us going to the doctor, and the 80% is social determinants of health. And um, Dr. Carmen Valdez is also a social worker, and her background is um, and work is focused on mental health and specifically mental health of immigrant communities. And my background is a medical anthropologist and focus on trauma-informed work with youth. And I've worked with a lot of youth. So it makes sense for, for us in a way of thinking about, um, again, not, not just the traditional medical way of things that affect our health, but really looking at those things such as transportation, access, food, um, things that affect mental health, race, discrimination, all of those factors. Um, so I think it is a really good marriage in terms of, of thinking about climate and justice and equity, but that also relate, that's all related and under the umbrella of health equity as well, and or the division of community engagement and health equity. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I believe we need to wrap up. Oh, we're um, at time already. We're at time. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sarah, do you have any um, closing words or anything like that? Yes. Thank you so much, Tasha and Jonathan, for presenting um, a few clothing, closing things. If you um, could take a few moments to fill out our evaluation of this webinar, um, I'm putting the link in the chat. Also, um, 
we have our next webinar registration is open now it's uh, birding and multiplier for liberation and justice i'm going to put that link in the chat as well if you are needing a cpe certificate for this workshop you do need to email me and let me know it will not be sent out automatically so you must email and again your name on your zoom needs to match the name that you have on that certificate if it does not match we cannot issue you a certificate um, so again, thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.